In this chapter, I want to discuss another difference between the global capitalist order and the sustainable development society that we need in the 21st century. And this relates to the relations of political jurisdictions, uh, intergovernmental relations between different nations uh, or uh, between uh, and among cities within a country uh, and so forth. It's pretty typical in thinking about uh, foreign policy and international affairs that competition between countries is treated uh, something like competition between companies that it's assumed that countries are in competition, uh, that in the world economy today, China is the rival of the United States. The United States has to act to uh, stop its rival or to better its rival, uh, that countries are competing uh, against each other, and uh, that this is the normal life in the same way that companies uh, compete uh, with each other. Uh, and indeed, uh, in real politics of uh, international statecraft, this uh, vision can be uh, quite brutal, uh, that it is uh, the job of one country to try to forestall uh, the development and success of another country, to try to contain the rise of another country. That international competition is a zero-sum struggle. Uh, one country up means another country down. These concepts are wrong conceptually because uh, they fail to understand that it's both possible and I would say indeed desirable that progress is made around the world, that one country's success is not the harm of another country unless we inadvertently or advertently but mistakenly try to make it so and that what we need are more sophisticated forms of cooperation among different political jurisdictions in order to succeed in the core purpose of politics, which is not to vanquish a foe, crush an opponent, better a rival, but is to achieve the common good and the well-being of the population, something that in principle can be enjoyed by all, especially if we're smart in how we use our resources and deploy our know-how. The concept that I would like to discuss briefly is the concept of subsidiarity, which I believe is the much healthier way to understand the relations uh, among uh, different uh, political jurisdictions, including interstate relations uh, across uh, nations of the world. The idea of subsidiarity, which has uh, strong roots uh, in uh, the Catholic tradition, in fact, is that we live in a world of uh, multiple political jurisdictions, a local community, a city, uh, perhaps a regional government, uh, perhaps a pr province or a state, a nation, a multinational entity like the European Union or African Union or ASEAN or NAFTA, and uh, the global political community, the United Nations, and that we should view these multiple jurisdictions as each playing a complementary role in the pursuit of the common good. It's not the job of these jurisdictions to compete with each other. Uh, it is their aim to promote the well-being of their members, but understanding that they're part of a uh, global community as well, where the different parts of this global community are also acting to promote their own well-being. The idea of subsidiarity makes a very specific claim that the appropriate way of problem solving is to have the jurisdiction closest to the people that is capable of addressing the problem be responsible for solving the problem. In other words, subsidiarity calls for taking a 
problem that needs to be solved to the lowest feasible level. If a problem can be well addressed at the city level, that's where the solution should be found. If it's a national problem uh, that no single city within the country can address, that is where the problem should be addressed. If it is inherently a cross-border issue, it will require a regional solution of many uh, neighboring countries. If it is a global problem, then one requires a global agreement and global institutions. I like the doctrine of subsidiarity because it induces us to look at problem solving. It keeps our eye on the ball that the purpose of government is not war and not conflict, but addressing the needs of the citizenry, promoting the common good, and promoting well-being generally. So let me give some examples of subsidiarity in action. The lowest level of governance uh, is the household. And of course, many, many decisions in life are left to the household, where to live, uh, what kind of job to pursue, the religious beliefs uh, and followings of the family, choices of leisure time, of schooling for children, and so forth. We believe, uh, and the evidence is quite overwhelming, uh, that people want the freedom to make important life choices. That's not just a, uh, an ideological point. Uh, as I've noted earlier, uh, expressed well-being is strongly correlated with an individual's perception that they have the ability to make important life choices. It's not always been like that, and for millions of people in the world today, it's definitely not like that now. People who are trapped uh, in slavery, trapped in uh, human bondage, don't even have, of course, that most minimal level of life choices. But the household is the level of governance uh, closest to, to all of us, and uh, key issues uh, uh, for our well-being depend on us being able to make our own choices. The local community is a vital uh, polity, uh, a vital political institution for many of the sustainable development goals. Uh, the schools and the clinics uh, and the last mile infrastructure, how uh, we're connected to the uh, internet, uh, how we receive our information, how our sewerage works, is not uh, generally uh, the responsibility, nor should it be the responsibility of a national government. It's the responsibility of the local community or the city government. For many, many kinds of actions, the subnational government, a large metropolitan area or a province or a state, uh, is uh, an appropriate uh, scale uh, to uh, address problems. It's quite typical, for example, in Canada, in Scandinavia, in Germany, in many, many other countries to an extent in the United States as well, that the health system, even if it's bound by national regulation, is governed and managed at a provincial level. In many federal systems where there is a union or national government and uh, uh, states or provinces, the United States, India, Canada, Australia, and others, it's very often the case that health uh, is a state subject, so-called, uh, that the province or the state has the responsibility for organizing the key institutions of health delivery. That is also true for many parts of uh, infrastructure. But it's also the case that the province or state is typically too low to solve other problems on infrastructure. One can't build a national highway system uh, based on uh, 
state prerogatives on where to build each road. We can imagine uh, the system not connecting very effectively. We cannot have a, uh, an efficient power transmission system and a renewable energy system that depends uh, on subnational entities if uh, the nation or even larger geographic range is vital for transmitting uh, renewable energy to uh, the final users, as it's almost surely the case. Uh, also, in most circumstances, the predominant taxation within a country is not determined by individual localities setting their own tax rates, but rather at the national level, and there's a good reason for that. If you have uh, two states or two cities that are setting a substantial amount of taxation, there will tend to be competition between those jurisdictions in which one will try to reduce tax rates just relative to the other uh, in order to drive business uh, towards the lower rate. The other will uh, respond accordingly, and there will be what is sometimes called the race to the bottom of these jurisdictions cutting their tax rates, each one trying to just be lower than the next. Whereas they would like to agree, let's not have that race to the bottom. And the most effective way to do that, in fact, is to leave the rate setting to the national government. So that's a case where subsidiarity tells us that the locale, the city, or even the province is not the right level other than for a modest level of taxation, or perhaps some property taxes or some sales taxes, but for the major income taxation, for example, it would be at the national level. And similarly, in almost all nations now, uh, trade among cities or trade between states of a country or provinces cannot be blocked by one local government or another imposing a tariff or a quota on the trade within the country. In other words, the nation state defines uh, the uh, scope of the market and prohibits interference at the more local level. That's not a, a given because throughout history, uh, locales have imposed uh, all kinds of trade barriers, and in some places that's still the case. But in the logic of subsidiarity, it's generally assigned uh, trade policy to the national level, not to the sub-national level. Increasingly, for sustainable development, the nation state is too small. For most ecological challenges, for uh, conservation of biodiversity, where species cross national borders and don't show their passport uh, as they're uh, crossing uh, a shared uh, ecozone, or where renewable energy is on one side of a border, but the uh, need for it is on the other side of the border, or where a river simply did not consult with the politicians and runs through several countries uh, rather than being uh, limited to one nation means that the proper ecological management, environmental management, cannot exist at the national level. This is a basic truth and still a tremendous practical problem in Europe, a uh, champion of sustainable development, where the European Union has many European-wide goals, but the prerogatives for the energy system are largely left still to the nation state, to the extent that countries uh, are not yet coordinated in having transmission lines between them, uh, or that there's no plan at the European level being implemented to bring solar energy from southern Europe up to the countries in northern Europe where solar energy is less uh, economical and so forth. Regional groupings 
at the level of the European Union, the African Union, ASEAN, NAFTA, are absolutely critical in this world for effective, efficient environmental management. And therefore, the tendencies that we sometimes see towards nationalism, towards uh, breaking apart of these regional groupings or weakening them, is disheartening and especially wrong-headed in an era where environmental management across national boundaries is so vital. And finally, global cooperation is the only appropriate level for many, many of the challenges that we face. Otherwise, we're likely to experience war and conflict and an inability to solve crucial problems. Climate change is inherently an issue for the world. That's why we have a UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. That's why we have a Paris Climate Agreement that at least till now has all 193 UN member states in it, despite the threat of Donald Trump, the absurd threat, I would say, from a conceptual point of view, to pull the US alone out of an agreement that is otherwise universal. Why do we need universality? It's because the carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases that we put in the air mix in the atmosphere and affect the whole planet. And so the whole planet is affected by what any individual country does. And that means that each one has an incentive to harm the global commons. And the way to overcome the tragedy of the commons is through global shared action, nothing less than an agreement to limit greenhouse gas emissions in order to keep a safe global climate. This is true with biodiversity similarly, where we have a shared global need and heritage for biodiversity and where it is global supply chains that are putting a tremendous amount of that shared heritage of biodiversity at huge threat. It's crucial for war and peace. Even though you have local belligerents, uh, neighbors perhaps uh, threatening to fight each other, we understand full well that the ramifications spill over to the whole world. And that's why Franklin Roosevelt, in his genius uh, as the US president during World War II, made such a heroic and monumental effort to uh, create with other nations a united nations in which the locus of war and peace decision making under international law would be put in a responsible institution at the global level, the UN Security Council. It's why the UN member states are attempting to negotiate a migration compact, a code of conduct regarding migration, where regrettably the U.S. withdrawal from that global effort is weakening the cooperation at the global level that is absolutely called for. And it, of course, is why we have a universal declaration of human rights, because human rights are universal, because the very purpose is to respect the dignity of people everywhere irrespective of their nation, their race, their religion, their creed, their income class, their gender. And the universality of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a profound inspiration for us to know that we can work at a global scale for human dignity and human well-being and a great spur for us to work at the global scale for sustainable development, which itself is part of a universal agenda as expressed in Agenda 2030 and the 17 Sustainable Development Goals.